Hello, my name is uh, Jordi Alonso. I am director of the Epidemiology and Public Health Program at the IMIM, the uh, Hospital del Mar Institute for Biomedical Research and co-director of the Scientific Committee of BiblioPro. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on PROMS and PREMS in practice. The webinar is organized jointly by Hospital del Mar uh, Medical Research Institute in the area of epidemiology and public health of the Spanish Network Center for Biomedical Research, CIBERESP. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, this webinar is part of the dissemination activities of BiblioPro, the online repository of patient reported outcomes in Spanish, which is now an official platform of CIBERESP. In a minute, Dr. Monse uh, Ferrer, uh, co-director of uh, the BiblioPro Scientific Committee, will give you a brief update on BiblioPro. Let me just uh, remind you that this online, free, public access repository has been continuously devoted to the mission of promoting and facilitating the use of PROMS and PREMS. A large interdisciplinary scientific committee has worked through the years for identifying, classifying, and making available the maximum information possible about PROMS and PREMS in a Spanish language. BiblioPro has become one of the largest resources of this nature in the world, with users all around the globe. Our webinar today focuses on the reality of PROMS and PREMS, and it includes three international recognized speakers, Drs. Judy Baumhauer, uh, Dr. Jose Maria Valderas, and Dr. Tania Stam. They will provide us with a real practice perspective of PROMS and PREMS in clinical settings, health services management, and health systems evaluation. They will be introduced uh, and moderated by Dr. Aida Rivera, a health outcome researcher who is a member of the BiblioPro Scientific Committee as well. After the three presentations, there will be common uh, a slot of half an hour for questions and answers through the chat. I hope you will find uh, this webinar interesting and stimulating. And now I hand it over to Dr. Mon Dr. Montserrat Ferrer, co-director of the Scientific Committee of BiblioPro. Thank you, Jordi. I'd like to share with you some exciting news about BiblioPro. Um, the, I, I am not sure if you are. Yes. Do you have my the presentation? Uh, the yes. view of the presentation. OK. BiblioPro's vision is, uh, is to become an international scientific reference platform for the distribution of patient reported outcomes and experiences, PROMS and PREMS. Our mission is uh, to promote the measurement of PROMS and PREMS in research, okay. clinical practice and health management through the generation of detailed information resulting from systematic literature reviews, uh, the production la seva passar, va. Mm, the production of scientific evaluations and the provision of a specialized uh, training. Sorry, uh, I come back to the presentation because I okay. Okay. Some some data about BiblioPro. It comes with more than 2,000 instruments and more than 22,000 users registered. Uh, you can see the evolution of these numbers in, in the figures. And we manage each year around 600 licenses of PROMS. Uh, the website receives, receives around 60,000 annual visits by users from 25 countries. Um, the, the BiblioPro is, uh, is now going international and we have recently started um, its international expansion with the, de the development of the new BiblioPro International website that will, uh, that will allow the distribution of PROMS in language other than Spanish. This new platform includes adapted versions for the countries around the world of the instruments developed in Spain, as well as the management of licenses for the most widely used family of generic instruments, the SF Health Surveys. BiblioPro International will follow the same line of work as BiblioPro Spain, offering the authors of the instruments various options for reproduction and distribution, 
promoting respect for intellectual property rights and allowing users to locate the instrument and send a license request. As in the Spanish version, user reg registration will be free. Um, MPRO, MPRO is the acronym of evaluating the measurement of patient reported outcomes. Uh, MPRO was designed to perform a standardized assessment of the quality of PROMS based on the medical outcome trust guidelines. And it considers both the methods applied in the studies and the adequacy of the results obtained. Uh, evidence about its validity, reliability and usefulness were published in Value Health in 2008. And since MPRO evaluation has been applied on more than 200 prompts published in scientific journals. MPRO, the new uh, at this moment is the online platform. Uh, it is a pleasure to present the, the new online platform, which enables an independent review by several appraisals and the consensus process to achieve an agreement working totally online. Each MPRO criterion appears on the screen, uh, like here, uh, that presents it, its specific criteria for scoring recommendations and response options. PROMS publications uh, can be consulted in parallel on a, on a split screen. And once, once all appraisers finish their, their evaluation, they can access the consensus screen. Uh, you can see here the, the consensus screen, which displays the, all the appraisers' anonymized responses, so they can comment and modify the responses to achieve an agreement. Um, when, when there is consensus, this online platform calculates the, the MPER scores for each instrument. For example, here, uh, the results obtained by the Minnesota Living with Hair Failure Questionnaire in each attributed evaluated, concept and measure, and measure and model, reliability, validity, sensitivity to change, interpretability, interpretability burden, and alternative modes of administration. Uh, and it is also possible to obtain comparative results with figures and like this uh, when several prompts from an area are evaluated. Uh, where we can observe um, uh, MPRO scores obtained uh, here, we can observe MPRO scores obtained by the prostate cancer specific PROMS uh, evaluated and published previously. Uh, thank, you, thank you for joining us in this webinar, and which will be moderated by Aida Rivera. Hello. Uh, hello, thank you, Monse. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to be here today to introduce and moderate the excellent panel we, we have. Um, I will be very brief, just, just a couple of minutes, to, um, because I would like to put the people who are listening to us into context a little bit, especially those people who maybe have only recently been involved in the, in the use of patient reported outcomes and experiences. Um, PROMs and PREMs are very well established in the field of research for many health conditions. Uh, quality standards uh, that are required for them are also very, very high. And the research community has been working for decades to set up the tools. Uh, we have just seen a, a perfect example with the Biblia Pro that Monse has been uh, explaining. And this is a, an excellent example of all that effort that we, the, we have made in research. So we have now uh, valid and highly reliable measurement tools for many health conditions and outcome, yeah, as outcome indicators in clinical trials and observational studies. We have start, started using them as also as key outcome indicators in quality assessment, uh, such as adopting uh, the value-based healthcare perspective, for, for instance. And we have also, in many instances, uh, demonstrated feasibility and efficacy of their implementation in the clinical setting. But still, I think that implementation, uh, the, the true and sustained adoption in practice beyond uh, research, remains uh, very challenging. 
Um, our three speakers today are going to talk about this, about uh, how they face these challenges in their respective fields. Uh, before before we start, just uh, I just give you a few reminders. Uh, first to the speakers, I would kindly ask you to keep your presentation no longer than 15 minutes uh, so that we have time for a rich discussion afterwards. And uh, to the audience, just to remind you that you can send your questions or comments through the chat. And after the three presentation, I will read them to the to the speakers at the end of the three um, uh, sessions. Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce now Dr. Jose Maria Valderas. Um, uh, Chema is a friend of us. Uh, he's an academic general practitioner and also a professor of health services and policy research at the University of Exeter. He has always been committed to patient-centered care and in the use of patient reported outcomes in primary care as a tool for decision making at different levels from the clinical practice to the to health policies. And he has also been an active member of the BiblioPro scientific committee since its beginning. Um, Dr. Valdera's work is the basis for the OECD's uh, Paris project. Uh, the Paris project, as he is going to explain us right now, is a highly ambitious program of systematic development of passion reported uh, indicators worldwide, involving a large number of countries, including OECD uh, members, but also non-members. So thank you very much, Gemma. Uh, you can go on. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, I am going to um, present to you uh, the work that has um, that we that the current state of the work around the uh, Paris Initiative. See, you hear me hesitating is because I want to make sure that I have I can control the time and here it is perfect. Thank you. So um, the OECD, the Organization for the Economic Development and Cooperation, has is an international organization which is leading the way in the um, development and use of indicators of healthcare performance, and is uh, really it's very it has a rather impressive uh, and rich set of indicators um, which cover all these uh, topics that I will not necessarily uh, read individually. What is uh, particularly uh, um, relevant uh, to the to 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 the uh, to the seminar webinar today is that the the, rec the institution recognized that there wasn't any sufficient focus on patient reported indicators, and that's the the rationale for um, the development of the Paris Initiative. Now, why is it called Paris? Well, it's patient reported indicators surveys. And also, you may be familiar with, uh, perhaps in education, with PISA, uh, which is a flagship program of the OECD in relation to education. Well, they wanted to make Paris the equivalent of, uh, in terms of health system performance. And the idea is to uh, have um, a uh, two uh, uh, major uh, lines of work. One specifically related to patients with chronic conditions, people living with chronic conditions, uh, and also, uh, as you will see in the bottom of the other slide of this slide, uh, condition and procedure uh, specific uh, indicators. And for both of them, uh, the idea is to have generic uh, PROMS and PREMS and condition uh, specific uh, PROMS and PREMS. So the um, the the framework under which uh, OECD Paris works is one of evaluation of health system performance. We will see other approaches to the use of PROMS and PRENS uh, today in this webinar, but this is the particular flavor of the uh, Paris um, initiative. What is relevant is that still ongoing and that the main focus of what I will be introducing is what's the situation for patients with chronic problems in primary care with and without multimorbidity. I'm just raising the issue of uh, uh, multimorbidity because in its, its originally it wanted to be um, uh, 
um, specifically uh, focus on patients with multimorbidity. And I, uh, together with Jordi Alonso and others, uh, uh, were um, privileged enough to to uh, support the development of the of the survey. And the case was made uh, for multimorbidity being, if you want, a particular case of chronic condition. So th there is merit in taking a, a broader perspective. Um, the, uh, the development of these indicators starts with the development of a conceptual framework. So what it is that we need to measure. I will spare you the detail on how uh, this uh, framework uh, was uh, developed, uh, but basically um, uh, we reviewed uh, literature, uh, we uh, in engaged with a, a patient um, reference group um, we engaged with a patient uh, with an expert uh, uh, group as well um, we conducted interviews and uh, workshops uh, virtually uh, across different countries combining uh, patients uh, with chronic conditions in uh, countries uh, that share the same language in the same focus groups and through an iterative process um, we developed this framework what you can find here is in blue. The blue boxes are, if you want, the context that has to do with the health system design and policy, and also uh, re variables relevant to the delivery system, uh, both in relation to clinics and to the main uh, healthcare professional. And you see in different shades of green, the variables that are relevant uh, to uh, to, to individual uh, patients and in general people living with chronic conditions. Uh, and these include from individual and sociodemographic factors to th four core uh, aspects that uh, we agreed were crucial to the, to the measurement of experiences and outcomes. Health behaviors, uh, because they are uh, a key determinant of uh, uh, both experiences and outcomes. Health and healthcare capabilities, uh, that include is a sort of a container term, term that tries to overcome some of the um, uh, um, conceptual um, minefield, which at present is uh, uh, the overlapping um, concepts of patient activation, patient literacy, patient engagement, patient involvement, um, self-efficacy. So uh, you can find uh, proponents and uh, very uh, uh, um, uh, um, hard-nosed <laughs> proponents of each of these different domains, they, which overlap to some degree. Uh, it wasn't uh, because of time uh, constraints. It was not. Uh, uh, it was beyond their task to uh, uh, um, propose a specific organization of those concepts. But we recognize their importance. And also, you, then you have the experiences of care, which include aspects related to access, comprehensiveness, continuities, and coordination that many of you will recognize as uh, core functions of primary care, safety, uh, people centeredness. Uh, and we recognize three subdomains there, individualization of care, decision making and interacting with health professionals. Uh, two other key uh, um, domains that emerge through the iterative process, self-management, support and trust and an overall perception of quality of care. And finally, what you see at the bottom is uh, patient reported outcomes. Um, and we followed a uh, framework that uh, synthesizes um, uh, brings together uh, the, uh, the international classification of functioning uh, model by the WHO and the Wilson and Cleary uh, model. And basically recognized it distinguishes symptoms, functioning, self-reported health and health related quality of life. So that was the, the absolute uh, uh, center of anything that happened uh, uh, subsequently. Once agreed that this is what we needed to measure, then uh, we needed to uh, uh, make progress in how to measure it. Um, so in order to ensure that there was efficiency, we decided uh, to uh, um, base it uh, as much as possible on existing uh, instruments. Um, so we conducted uh, literature reviews. Uh, we ensured that the information we collected on the instruments identified was comprehensive. So this means that beyond literature reviews, we actually did a lot of, if you want, great literature search in terms of uh, citations of each uh, instrument, uh, 
um, um, domains uh, that were covered, uh, who was the uh, main author, what were the languages in which it was uh, translated, etc. Uh, and we mapped each of these instruments onto the framework that you have seen. The next step was to build the, the core blocks of the uh, um, of the uh, of the survey that would serve as the, the basis for the data collection of these indicators. So in order to do so, we ranked and shortlisted all the instruments that we had previously identified for each of the different domains of experiences, of outcomes, of uh, health and healthcare capabilities, of uh, behaviors. And uh, uh, we conducted an evaluation of the, the performance using uh, MPRO, which uh, Dr. Ferrer has previously uh, uh, revisited, and also conducted a prioritization and selection um, exercise. Um, um, that uh, was based on a Delphi process. Again, I will, I will spare you uh, the details. Um, we subsequently, uh, uh, once we had agreed on the core elements, we realized, of course, that there was they, they strong as they were, they did not provide all the elements that were needed. Therefore, we went back to all the instruments uh, identified and tried to identify uh, scales uh, selected items that would, in a very parsimonious way, uh, provide uh, uh, the uh, different elements that were needed to to provide a complete picture of the uh, of the of the framework. Again, through evaluation and ranking, and uh, subsequently we did some preliminary testing. Sorry, of applicability. Uh, with, uh, we developed our paper draft version, we checked the administration time and also did some preliminary checks for translatability. Um, yes, so this is just a reminder of what how the uh, framework looks like. This is what the resulting instrument uh, looks, uh, what it includes. Uh, it has uh, 100 and ar around 110 items at present because at this, as, as we speak, items are being in and out at a very uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, rate of change, but there are still being some, some changes. We estimate up to 25 minutes, and these are the main sources of information that we have uh, that are being used for describing the sociodemographics and issues about uh, um, patient characteristics. We draw on uh, existing indicators from OECD, WHO, uh, the Commonwealth Fund and the World Bank for um, measurement uh, uh, behaviors and uh, health and healthcare capabilities that uh, we conceptualize in this domain of managing your own health and healthcare, uh, we relied on uh, existing instruments, the uh, International Physical Activity Questionnaire, TAPS, uh, the European uh, Health uh, Survey uh, for some uh, questions as well, the Porta Novelli uh, scale, and also uh, eHealth uh, for uh, e-health uh, uh, literacy and GPPAs, -S, which is a uh, uh, experience survey used in the UK. When you see um, um, uh, the dotted uh, line around an instrument, it means that we didn't use all of them. We used a selection, whereas the other ones are used in full. And for experiences of healthcare, you can see again uh, a number of uh, instruments, of selected instruments. In terms of your health, um, we used in full the PROMISE 10 global measure, the WHO Wellbeing Index, and a question about um, uh, uh, um, respiratory, about um, dyspnea. Apologies. So, this is where we are at present. The next steps will be uh, uh, the translation. Uh, the, we have already started uh, the translation and we hope to have it completed uh, in the next few months. Uh, subsequently, there will be piloting of this survey uh, to collect information on uh, the uh, on how the scales work uh, because some of them are developed ex novo. This piloting will take place in circa 20 countries, which include both major OECD countries, including uh, including Spain, including the US, including Canada, including the uh, England and Wales on representation of of the UK uh, um, uh, and Norway and many others uh, in within the OECD, but also elsewhere. 
So Bra Brazil has expressed an interest. It's we it's be we consider whether they will be able to join us. But we know, for instance, that Saudi Arabia, which is also not part of the OECD, will join. So it has really attracted the interest of of uh, many different countries. Once we are we have confirmed the the suitability of all our tools, the proper data collection will take place during 2023 in all these different countries and then uh, the proper analysis and dissemination of the the, the information uh, will be conducted in 2024 so as you can see we are early, it's early days in the development of this uh, program of work um, and uh, I hope uh, to be able to uh, update you in different fora on the progression of this initiative uh, over the coming months and years thank you Thank you very much, Chema. Uh, really, really ambitious. Yes. Uh, I think we are ready for for Jody's uh, Jody's presentation. Are we? So, Jody, if, if you are ready, you can you can go on, please. This is the best example I have from a study in uh, 2008, where they asked uh, patients and providers about uh, questions about breast cancer. The, they, the first question was, is it important to keep your breast? Well, the patient, 7% of them said it was important. 71% of the providers said it was important. See that disconnect? What about live as long as possible? 59% of patients felt it was important, but they recognized that quality of life is more important than quantity of life. Providers, 96% felt that it was important for the patient to keep their breast. See that disconnect? We should totally be listening to what our patients hope uh, to get out of their treatment in order to provide the best care. Next slide. Because we recognize that the patient is king or queen. Next slide. So if you want to know how your patients are doing, you need to just ask them. And Andre, can you put the first video on. If it's too complicated, we could skip the videos. Hi, how are you? Hi, good. Uh, one o'clock. What's your last name? Smith. And your date of birth? One one seventy six. And who are you seeing today? Mitten. And any changes to address, phone numbers? No, it's all the same. Before the patient is seen, they fill out their uh, patient reported outcomes. And at that time, as they're checking in, we're able to gather that information. It literally takes 2.4 minutes, and I'll go over that with you. And then once we see the patient, then we talk to them about their history. We, we examine them. We get x-rays and studies. And then we make a diagnosis and treatment plan in concert with the patient, also looking at the patient reported outcomes. So next slide, please. And one more slide, please. So when we thought about what patient reported outcomes we wanted to use, we realized in a very busy clinic area like ours in orthopedics, we see 17,000 patient visits a month, a month. So we needed a validated instrument that was quick, that didn't slow down the clinicians from getting those patients seen, that wasn't costly because we can't really afford it in, in medical care these days. It needed to be generalizable so that it could not only help with orthopedic musculoskeletal problems, but it could help with asthma. It could help with your urologic problems. It could help with diabetes, whatever whatever conditions we're interested in, in symptoms we're interested in measuring and managing. It needed to be flexible for those different areas. We needed to be able to see it in the electronic record and we needed to be able to search it so we could look at it from a different uh, standpoint from uh, group aggregate data and uh, do some research with it. Next slide, please. So we landed on using the PROMISE, which is, as many of you might know, the Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System, an 11-year, $100 million effort by the NIH. That What made it unique was that it was domain-specific and not disease-specific. So it asked about symptoms instead of diseases. And that allowed us to 
to standardize across these symptom complexes with a, with a uh, T-score and then look at uh, standard deviations of 10 points. We allow, it allows us to follow through our healthcare system, which it has gone beyond orthopedics into about 60 to 70% of our healthcare system currently. It produces validated data very quickly using uh, computer adaptive technology and item response theory. Next slide, please. So first, next slide, we collected in orthopedics, physical function, pain interference, and depression, because those are areas that the patients found important that they wanted to measure, and then we could manage those symptom complexes. And once we got, we got it humming in orthopedics, next slide, we took it over to cancer was our next partner, really. And although they liked those three core ones in orthopedics, they also added anxiety because when people get cancer, they get anxious. Next slide. And then we went to, to palliative care, who recognized that fatigue was a major player in their patient population. Next slide. And then we went to urology. You can see how you can sort of dial it into the different areas of medicine and pick symptoms that are important to your patients in that area. Next slide, please. People often ask, why, why would orthopedists get depression scores? Because we recognize that the patient's ability to cope with injury and illness is equally important as we're uh, drafting uh, treatment plans. And we, this article highlighted that where the mental health component was a stronger association with patients who had shoulder pain and rotator cuff tears than even their physical function and pain. So. It was uh, really important to us to get uh, also their emotional health, if you will. Next, next slide. The SMART guys, of which jo Jordy was one of them, uh, looked at uh, a lot of different legacy instruments, and they have published uh, uh, on a website many of the comparisons between Promise and some of the legacy instruments that you may be familiar with. Next slide. Here's just an example of PHQ-9, a depression score. It shows you T-score on the x-axis and the scalable information on the y-axis and compares PHQ-9 with promised depression. You can see that down at the lower tail, that promised depression is actually more responsive uh, to change uh, than, than, at, uh, than the PHQ-9 is. And these are the areas that we want to measure and manage. These are the patient population. That's why it becomes important to us. Next slide, please. Here's just a summary of our information that we have currently up until May. We have uh, 285,000 unique patients over 3.3 million scores. For the three promised domains that I talked about, it takes 2.4 minutes. You can see centrally here, there's the majority are physical function, pain interference, and depression. But we also have other PROs that we're collecting. And of course, we also have pediatric and, uh, patient and parent proxy domains that we're interested in. Next slide, please. What we do is we provide some, some um, scorecards, if you will, to uh, administration and also to, to providers to let them know what their uh, average patient population uh, PROs are and uh, their collection rates and things like that. It has really been a real uh, jump for us in regards to uh, research publications across our institution as well. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to show you just how we use this data. Next slide. This is just an example of a screenshot in, in our electronic record. It's our dashboard. And this happens to be three, the three uh, core domains. And this is a patient of mine. You can see all the way to the left is the starting baseline scores, and all the way to the right is the most recent scores. X On the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is uh, t-score. And we have it in severity bands. The red line is physical function, the green is, is pain interference, and the blue is depression. So I click on this outcomes tab that you see on the upper area, and this uh, and the the promise in the central area, and I get this this uh, graphic display, which is really quite intuitive for patients. Up is good, down is bad, and I can show this to my patients and show them over the course of time how they're 
functioning with their different treatment plans. Next slide. So when I first see a patient, the first thing I do is I open up their outcomes even before I go into the room, because I want to know, next slide, what their baseline values are if they're a new patient. Are they impaired? If they're not impaired, if they're all in the green, then we're not, probably not gonna spend a million dollars on this patient. We wanna use things that are gonna be more cost effective because they're already doing pretty darn well. And they just wanna either be, uh, I guess, uh, confirm that they're doing okay with their current condition or they want some tips. Next, next slide. So then you look at the end. And if I, this is the end of a visit uh, journey with a patient, I realize they're all in the green at this time frame. I know that that office visit is going to be less than a minute long, probably, because they're doing quite well and they're, they're going to uh, um, march out of here being ha happy with it. And the other thing that we look at is we look at uh, something called the PASS score, which which is patient acceptable symptom state. It's other anchoring questions. Can you live with these symptoms? So I'll cl click on some of these other outcomes that the patient has reported to me. And these are all helpful in judging what I might do next for this patient. If they feel they can live with the symptoms, again, you don't want to go uh, sending them for uh, custom inserts or, or uh, physical therapy that's going to be very costly to them. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through uh, this exact same graph, and I'll tell you this patient's story. Next. Here they came in, and they were, had bad ankle arthritis. I, I diagnosed them, got x-rays, uh, discussed it with them, and we talked about a treatment plan. They are impaired. Next. Their treatment plan was non-operative uh, treatment, some of the simple things like, like a brace and non-steroidals. Then I see them back, and yet their pain is even a little bit worse. Their function's a little bit worse, but they're still managing their mood pretty well. But it's time to think about something different because that wasn't working. Next slide. So we started to talk about surgical options and got a decision plan. We did an ankle fusion on this patient. And when you put them in a cast on a pair of crutches, their physical function's in the tank into the severe line, but they're not having much pain and actually their mood is good because they're on a treatment plan that they think is positive and it's gonna help them with their ankle. Next slide. Then we put them into a walking cast so they're a little bit better. Next slide. Then we take them out of their cast and start them on some therapy. Next slide. And then we see their, their final result as they come in. So it's these, uh, these graphs are really quite um, visual and helpful in monitoring people. And this is a good outcome, of course. Next slide. Well, what if you see this, where you see somebody that's going down instead of up? Well, that might mean that something else is happening. Next slide. This is a patient who had a uh, hip replacement. Next slide. And they're, they're doing worse. So maybe this is an indication of a loosening hip or an infected hip, or something is going astray. Some pattern where we're actually not thinking is is uh, positive. And that entails more discussion and more treatment. This also shows you this uh, dashboard where there's other PROs that are listed here. This particular line is just the physical function line. Next slide, please. So here's some questions that the patients ask, and we use our patient reported outcomes to help answer these. For instance, will I be more physically active with surgery? The Patient has bad knee arthritis and is considering a knee replacement, and yet their T-score is 47, and the U.S. norm is 50. They're functioning pretty darn well. Next slide. Well, we did some, some uh, analyses on this, and we took an aggregate of 118 patients who had knee replacements and followed them up nearly a, nearly a year, and we looked at ROC curve analyses to determine the threshold values for achieving or failing to achieve a minimally clinically important difference. And in this particular case, next slide, this patient had a 44.5%, uh, I'm sorry, had a, a T-score of 47, which is above the 44.5 T-score that had an 88% probability of failing to achieve MCID. So what does that mean? That means the chance of them getting better with surgery is really quite slim. So you should really think about other 
for options. Next slide, please. So if I say this a little different way, if you were an internist and you were collecting promised physical function and, and your, your internist saw you and your knee had some arthritis, but your physical function was greater than 45, perhaps your internist would not send you over to the surgeon, but actually uh, probably manage you with some other non-operative management, saving some healthcare dollars. Next slide, please. If we actually use that uh, uh, type of logic, we applied this to our past year for a number of different procedures, and we'd save millions of dollars by not operating on patients who wouldn't necessarily benefit from the surgery. Next slide, please. There are several different procedures to treat my problem. How do I choose the best one? Next slide. Here's three different procedures for ankle instability. They actually stratify around their physical function. And guess what we did with this data? We give it back to the surgeons and we say there's the same diagnosis, but three different treatments and one does better. What are you going to do? You're going to do the one that does better. And guess what? The one that does the worst actually costs the most. Next slide. There are several dis different surgeons. Who do I choose? Next slide. So here's uh six different surgeons and and uh, for acl reconstructions from our sports team we wanted to see if anybody's outcomes were better than the others and we could learn from each other and actually it stayed pretty pretty consistent amongst all of them but they did have cost differential between the six of them so we can align our costs so we're looking at variation and how to get the best outcomes for the best uh treatments Next slide, please. When will I be able to go up to the, go to the uh, basement to do the laundry? Next slide. We did some benchmarking. Here's a just circled here is climbing stairs. And red is unable to do. Uh, blue is no difficulty, and there's it's stratified green, yellow, and orange in between. So if we drop a line, next slide, that says you can go up and down the stairs at normal pace and drop another line around the T-score of this, then you recognize that it, next slide, it's gonna be a T-score of around 42. Next slide. Next slide. If we drop that with my patient, my ankle fusion patient, next slide. One more slide. You can see that this goes at about 10 weeks in their recovery period from their surgery. So you can see how all of these things can be dialed in to, to uh, ask uh, good questions and help our patients understand their recovery road. Next slide. Now I gotta caution you because you gotta ask what the patient wants. I just did all of this at talking about physical function, but perhaps maybe it's not physical function that the patient wants. For those who don't recognize it, this is a bunion where there's a prominent bone by the great toe and it rubs in people's shoes. Well, it really doesn't hurt them at all and they can function quite well unless they're in closed shoes. And in Rochester, New York, it's icy and snowy like eight months out of the year. So what they really want is to fit into shoes comfortably. So you have to ask the right questions. You can see by this little graph that I dropped in here that if you go all the way over to the left where their baseline scores, they're all in the green. Maybe I shouldn't be operating on them. But actually what they wanted was to fit into shoes. And we did get them to fit into shoes when we correct their bunion. So ask the patient what it is that they want and uh, uh, measure and monitor that symptom complex. Next slide, please. I knew that they, they needed something because their past score said I was unsatisfactory and after surgery, it's satisfactory. So I did make them better. Next slide, please. So we use all of this uh, information to do some predictive modeling as I shared with you. Next slide, please. And patients do feel engaged and empowered by this information and has changed the practice that I provide for patients for sure. Next. There are challenges. There are a multitude of different challenges and uh, they include other things that you need to measure and manage for quality reasons and for payment models. And we need to align what's important to the patient with measuring what's, what uh, is important for 
reimbursement, if you will. Next slide. But there's also a lot of really great things that have happened, including uniting our healthcare system. Next slide. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Sorry about the challenges, and I look forward to the questions. Next slide. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, that was impressive. Uh, just uh, we just go go on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Tanya Stam. Uh, Dr. Tanya Stam is a researcher and professor for outcomes research at the Medical University of Vienna. She is the head of the section for outcomes research uh, in the Center for Medical Statistics, Informatics and Intelligence Systems. Dr. Stam is leading a very ambitious European project for collecting patient reported outcomes at large scale in four European countries, so giving voice to the patients with the final aim of improving health services. Uh, thank you very much, Tanya. We, you, you can go on. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Aida, for introducing um, me so nicely. And thank you very much for inviting me to give a presentation here today. Um, the title of my talk is how measuring outcome data can improve treatment decisions. And as Jordi, as you have said earlier, I think I will focus a little bit on the technical detail and managerial issues around outcome measurement. And I would also like to introduce a bit uh, the large uh, scale project that you have already touched upon. And I think we have already uh, heard a lot of different uh, issues which are very important and I will try to connect uh, to. Tania, we don't hear you. Um, now it should work, right? Yes, I'm sorry because I was trying to move to the next slide, but it didn't work and then um, unintentionally I muted myself. So I will talk a little bit on patient reported outcomes, which is the domains and the outcome measures, which then is the measure to actually uh, assess these domains. And what we also heard, and I think is very important, is the concept of value-based healthcare. And sometimes, especially in Europe, people talk about high value care, which puts more emphasis on the patient reported outcome or the patient outcome in general, and not on not so much on costs. Although I think we saw very, or we saw a lot of nice examples from Judy's talk why and how costs could be very important and give us also uh, additional information. And sometimes, and that's also something what uh, we have heard from the European Commission, is the idea to talk about or to focus on patient-centric care. So actually focus on really what uh, the patients want. And lastly, I would like uh, to say a few words about uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, IMI, Health Outcomes Observatories Project, and that's the large European project that you have already uh, mentioned. Um, so what are outcomes and especially uh, patient reported outcomes? Outcomes can be anything. It can be clinical signs and symptoms, but also results from uh, interventions. And uh, of course, one part of these outcomes is patient reported outcomes, outcomes which are directly reported by the patient and which include things like quality of life, functioning in daily life, but also pain, fatigue, or the, the impact of uh, specific symptoms on the daily activities of the patients. And very often these outcomes matter most uh, to, to the patients, as Judy has also mentioned already. And how do we assess these outcomes? Mostly in form of questionnaires, and these are traditional uh, paper-based uh, questionnaires, but and now we have a lot of different apps also where the patient can actually enter um, the data directly uh, into a specific app uh, and then also get some feedback. And that's something what we think is really important because uh, as has also been discussed, important is that we generate value for all stakeholders with the patient reported outcomes that we are collecting and also for the patients. So patients need to get some kind of feedback and especially with an app, it's possible to show the patients, for example, how they have been doing over the past uh, weeks. 
This is an example from musculoskeletal diseases where we have been uh, working a long time uh, in, in the past and uh, focused on, on patient reported outcomes there. An important dimension, I think, when we consider patient reported outcomes is that we need to make sure that the questionnaires actually include what really matters to the patients. And a lot of qualitative studies, and uh, you also showed that earlier, Judy, a lot of qualitative studies showed that in the questionnaires, we sometimes did not include what really mattered to the patient. So we did a few studies ourselves, and there are, of course, lots of examples from the literature. For example, fatigue was not covered in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, routine care assessment assessment for a long time because professionals didn't think it was so important, but it was really important to the patients. And in one of our studies in systemic sclerosis, personal and environmental factors, but also sexual functions and intimate relationships were not covered, but really important to the patients. And we also recently completed a study where we asked young people's perspective, whether they uh, are covered in the questionnaires we are commonly using in uh, rheumatoid uh, conditions. So that's also, of course, interesting because sometimes times are changing. People are using, for example, smartphones, which was not the case uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And all these things uh, or questionnaires sometimes might also need some kind of update to really uh, satisfy the needs of the patients. Um, this has been taken up by a lot of initiatives, and one of them uh, is the iGEM initiatives. And iGEM, as a consortium, has developed a lot of different uh, core outcome sets. And one uh, example is here that's the diabetes uh, core outcome sets, where you can see the different domains that have been specified that need uh, to be measured. And what is specific about uh, the iGEM activities is that patients are always part of the exercise. So, patient input is critical here. and it's not only the professionals proposing what needs to be measured, but the perspective of the patients is taken into account. And what uh, can, or what is another uh, important issue regarding this outcome core sets is that we, of course, have when you consider a specific domain, and here is an example of hand function. Uh, in hand osteoarthritis. And what you uh, can see here is that uh, to measure hand function, hand osteoarthritis, different uh, questionnaires are used. So a number of questionnaires exists and different centers use different questionnaires and it's difficult uh, to compare the data. And uh, that has also been introduced that uh, an approach in order to tackle this issue is to introduce a common metric so that you can say, for example, five of uh, one questionnaire is the same as nine in another questionnaire, and that relates back to a specific score on a common metric, which is an underlying metric scale on where you would measure hand functioning, for example. And this has been taken up by the PROMISE initiatives, and uh, the PROMISE has also been mentioned earlier. It, focuses on common metrics in specific domains. So, for example, physical functioning or fatigue, quality of life, well-being, and patients are given, and especially if you use computer adaptive testings, patients don't, do not need to fill out uh, a long list of questions, but are given very specific uh, questions for their state of ability, for their state of quality of life. So you can actually have a very uh, valid and reliable assessment with only a few questions which are very specific to the level of functioning or quality of life of a patient. What we have done uh, recently, uh, also as part of the uh, European, the large European project on outcomes, is that we looked into generic uh, PROs, uh, so some generic domains, which could be measured across diseases. And that's, of course, relevant if patients have more than one disease and could be also a general issue if, um, for example, outcome scores should be reported from different countries, then it could be interesting to report also something across the disease areas. And what came out of a literature review that Yuki Seidler and our team has conducted is the uh, green area here shows the different different PROs, the different patient reported outcomes that came out of this generic literature review and examples are physical well-being or social well-being or also quality of life or sleep quality. So these could be uh, domains which have a more generic uh, perspective which you could measure independent of the disease uh, in any patient. 
Yeah, so this is, of course, also another approach where we can uh, then, for example, better compare the health of uh, multimorbid patients or also compare value that has been created for the patients across disease areas. And what you can also see here is that the PROs, the domains, are different from the uh, PROMs, from the instruments. So when we, for example, establish an outcome set, we can agree on specific domains and then select based on, on expertise or on methodological uh, expertise, we can select specific instruments which then actually measure uh, the disease areas. For example, in the area of pain, we can then look uh, which of the questionnaires, for example, covers uh, pain or the same is for sleep quality or fatigue or cognition or other things. Yeah? So these could be two different steps. One is to agree on the PROs, the uh, domains, and one is to select uh, the instruments for measuring. What is the evidence for the use of, um, of PROs? And I think there is one which is really uh, an important study that has been done in oncology, which actually so showed that symptom monitoring reported by the patients themselves actually increased the survival of the cancer patients. So when patients uh, did and, and were involved in the self-reported symptom monitoring, this increased uh, their survival. So there is already evidence uh, or also for general health outcomes that the use of PROs or self-reported uh, symptom monitoring would increase even survival. What is our project now about? What is missing so far? And what we really think um, is an issue, especially when you look into PROMs, is that, or pros and PROMs, is that the data are not collected on a large scale. So there is a lot of different initiatives and clinical trials where we have collected PROMs, but PROMs are still very often not part of the consultation room and they are not collected in routine care data. And that's one of the um, main aims of our project, which we want to introduce in four European countries, we would like to collect patient reported outcome data in diabetes, in cancer and in inflammatory bowel disease on a very large uh, scale, so if possible population based. And um, this is a very large project where we have uh, different partners, different public partners, but as it is a public-private partnership, we have also partners from the pharma industries and we have two associated uh, partners also who are uh, GDRF is a patient organization in the diabetes area and Trial Nation is an organization in Denmark which is actually focused on, on uh, supporting clinical trials uh, also on a, a population basis in Denmark. And how we will do this, we will create a multi-stakeholder consensus on the outcome sets uh, to be measured and we will look into what is existing, so we will not reinvent the wheel, but look into the item sets, for example, and take this as a basis and we will specifically look into feasibility. And I think you mentioned that earlier, Judy, because feasibility of outcomes measurement is very important and patients will not fill out uh, or not fill in questionnaires if they have no value, if they do not get anything out of them. We will equip the patients with tools to measure their outcomes. So the idea is that patients will collect the data, but will also get some feedback. Um, so they will see, for example, how they have been doing for the past weeks. And they will be also uh, be able to compare themselves to a reference uh, population. And we will create an ethical framework around data governance. So the idea is that data should be shared uh, with other researchers from uh, very different sectors with all the stakeholders who have a need of the data. So we would like to, um, to collect the data, but also share the data so they could be really used by different initiatives, different researchers and uh, data should be uh, accessible also to patient organizations, for example, so that they can use uh, the data for advocacy for example. And how we will do that? We will um, establish in each of the four countries, which is Austria, Germany, the Netherlands and Spain, we will establish a national uh, outcomes observatory where we will collect patient reported outcomes in a centralized manner and we will leave all the clinical data where they are with the providers and uh, introduce a distributed analytics approach. That means that the analytic code will travel to where the data are, but we will not need to centralize the data in a large uh, database. And we will also look into sensor data, so data that are generated uh, 
in, in, in the daily life of the patients, for example, through sensors in the mobile phones or also uh, with continuous glucose monitoring for the diabetes patients. And um, we will initially focus on the four countries that are I have already mentioned, but we will then also uh, think of expanding to more countries. And for example, in Sweden, uh, population-based uh, clinical diabetes registry exists where we also plan to have a collaboration there. So we will also use and leverage the existing uh, initiatives. And, um, and now I think, Anders, uh, would it be possible to see the video that I have or that you have already prepared? Thank you. Like water, health data is an essential resource. It should be accessible to all stakeholders with a legitimate interest, including patients. It has the potential to inform and facilitate better conversations between okay. patients and their healthcare providers. The result is better so care for individuals and more stuck. efficient and sustainable healthcare systems for the entire community. So you will tell us when the video is finished. At this time, there are only very few examples of systematically Thanks. measured patient reported outcomes can, can being I be used cheeky, in individual Tanya, clinical you to care. Tell us what the video is about. No <laughs> widespread approaches exist it's to address this shortcoming on the, the scale. Um, how we will do this. So the 23 this world area. leading yeah. institutions, including university hospitals, patient organizations and industry partners are joining together to design the healthcare infrastructure of the future. The H2O project is the first ever attempt to collect and incorporate patient reported outcomes into healthcare decision making at an individual and population level across multiple locations in Europe. Within two years, H2O will set up independent observatories in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, and Spain, as well as a European umbrella observatory. The observatories will have an initial focus on diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, and cancer. H2O is being established such that it's capable of scaling up to more countries and more diseases in the future. Health Outcomes Observatory making health data as an essential resource available to all. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I've actually been asked by the other speakers because we didn't see the video now to say a few words on what the video was about. And it was about uh, the project, the uh, Health Outcomes Observatories project where we and where we aim to collect patient reported outcomes on a large scale in uh, four European countries in, in the three disease areas. And we will not only focus on patient reported outcomes because we think that also clinical outcomes in addition to the PROs are very relevant. And uh, we, will, we will have an independent national observatory in all the four countries and have also one European observatory, which should then be uh, kind of a standardization institution so that we will not collect different outcomes and we showed you uh, the common metric and also the transformation of uh, questionnaires into a common metric before but it's of, of course easier if everyone would agree on similar outcome measures uh, to use. Um, so, So taken together, in conclusion, we think that especially for the active self-management of patients, uh, important is to give them also a possibility to be involved in, in outcome measurement, to collect uh, patient reported outcomes because it better represents their perspective and active uh, patients will then also have a better uh, health outcome. And we have also seen that, uh, especially, for example, in the oncology area, there's even evidence that if patients are uh, involved in a monitoring scheme that leads to better survival. And shared decisions, of course, means giving patients power. So empowering patients is also part of our uh, H2O, of the Health Outcomes Observatories project. And uh, especially when, when you uh, think about uh, treating to a specific target or um, also value-based healthcare, the value that we generate uh, for the patients is a very important issue. 
And patient reported outcomes are thus an uh, essential aspect of health outcome measurement. And I think especially when we look into the current trends, um, we focus or possibilities to think of uh, value-based healthcare uh, model in the future where maybe also payments will be bundled and uh, made according to the value that is uh, generated for the individual patient. So taking into account patient outcome, I think is a very essential aspect in the future. And we also need to measure what matters to the patients. And I think we also need studies that really show us whether the questionnaires, whether the outcome measures that we are using is actually covering what is important for the patients. And we also need to do it in a very precise and from a technical perspective in an accurate manner. So we need also studies and experts on psychometrics and methodology and outcome researchers and managers in order to really develop tools which allow us uh, to measure the patient perspective uh, in a very good way and maybe also to translate things and you have and I think uh, you can be congratulated also on uh, what the, the repository that you are running uh, in, in Spanish language where you have the, the PROs uh, or make the PROs available also the prompts available to the clinicians and I think that's really an important initiative to do that also in a very good way so that we can compare then data from different countries and maybe uh, also across uh, disease areas and from different data Set. So I think that's really a very important initiative. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Tani. It was really insightful. Um, now it's time for questions and answers. I can ask you to put them in the chat. I will read them for you. You can put your name and to whom the question is, is for whom is the question, and I will read them for you. OK, so there's uh, there are some questions already. Uh, um, I read it for you. I have a question for Jose Maria Valderas. Um, thanks a lot for your great work, uh, great work with the uh, oh. Paris. Uh, if provider systems are going to be evaluated by PROMS PREMS, how do you think this information should be accepted or promoted and performed in usual care? Gemma? Thanks very much for the question. Um, so the um, we have um, already evidence of use of, of PROMS uh, for these purposes. Perhaps, um, uh, I mean, a, a very well known example is the uh, PROMS program in the UK, uh, by which information on uh, the uh, of PROMS scores at the aggregate level, at the provider level, are uh, obtained routinely for all patients that are receive uh, elective surgery. Um, so th there is good evidence of collecting the information, ways in which it could be uh, presented. Um, what does it tell us so far? Um, the, first of all, the uh, because of the nature of the uh, of the application, uh, it was it, it was not possible to actually un, uh, identify pockets of poor care. Uh, with these measurements, so the idea would be you would ideally uh, you would ideally identify perhaps uh, trust hospitals providers uh, providing care that was substandard using prompts and compared to other uh, um, uh, uh, providers. However, when when observed through a, a long a long uh, a period of time, it was realized that um, there was no consistency. Some uh, 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 providers appear to to pr provide uh, uh, poor care on one particular year and then subsequent year it was no longer the case. So there was con lack of consistency. That obviously does not need to be the case for other procedures or for other measurements. Um, but uh, what I want to stress with that is that we lack uh, strong evidence for how providers react to information that may challenge uh, the current practice. Um, in general, one of the key uh, problems is that um, it's all too easy to uh, dispute it uh, based on the uh, case mix. Uh, so a lot of effort is being put, particularly in Paris, in ensuring that uh, case mix is uh, makes a sort of robust case mix adjustment is being developed in collaboration with uh, providers, so that after the fact it cannot be used as a counter argument. 
Okay, thanks, Gemma. Um, there is also an interesting question for Judy. Um, Judy, how interpretable are for you proms? It looks like it looks like uh, that promise are easy, but how difficult is to make individual recommendation based on average scores, even even T scores? Do you find conflicts of PROMS results and your own evaluation of the passion? Yeah, I think, you know, I try to emphasize that it's sort of patterns. You know, maybe the absolute scores may help you if they're falling in the green or they're better than 50 on this on the promise scores or maybe it's the pattern that you're looking at and remember these are sort of I, I call them many people do validated histories they allow us to get a line that the patient is trying to share with us how they're feeling and functioning and yet we're interpreting it from their words a different way so we interpret it with their words and we interpret it with our t-scores so it sort of allows us to get aligned in two different ways so that we make sure we're on the same page. And, you know, the last thing I'll tell you is um, that if you're wondering, oh, what does this mean or whatever, ask your patient what it means. If you go into a room and someone is functioning great, they have absolutely no pain, and yet their depression scores are terrible, you go in and you say, you know, look, you look really sad. You told me you're really sad. What's going on? Well, my father just died. So it's it's a discussion. It's a discussion point. It isn't it isn't defining anything. It needs to go with a constellation of your exam and all, all these other things. And it can't be just a um, you know a single mark against it. But I do think they tell you trends. I do think in aggregate it is helpful. And I really like the last comment that said that providers prickle when they hear comments made about uh, threshold scores and stuff, but it's their data and their patients. So we haven't, we haven't asked anything of them that's uh, surprising. When we say you're operating on patients that are already functioning really well, what do you think you're do doing? I just wanna hear what they have to say. So um, I, I think that, um, you have to use it in concert with a bunch of other things. Okay. Uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, there is a question from Edurne Zabaleta for all the speakers. I read many thanks, many thanks to the speakers and the organizers of this interesting webinar. My question is addressed to all the speakers. Is there a connection integration of the initiatives you have presented with other initiatives such as COSMIN or COMET? I don't know, Chema, maybe you. So, um, the, um, I mean, any any efforts that are aimed to standardize, to increase standardization of efforts uh, at, uh, um, um, at you, if you want, at the global level, uh, must be welcome. Uh, we really have a um, 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 a situation in which I would argue there are too many uh, instruments, and that uh, uh, this creates some petty discussions about. Uh, uh, on, uh, 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 what instrument is better than the other. We need, really need to move towards uh, the identification of measurement systems that are comprehensive and that overcome uh, the problem of legacy measures. Um, Comet has been uh, interesting in, in, in the approach. I, um, I, I, I'm so I, I really welcome the initiative. I just just I'm just reflecting from a completely individual uh, 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 point of view. Uh, I, I, it has served the purpose of raising the interest. I'm not convinced that I've seen uh, strong uh, outputs that have made a difference, but I'm, I'm sure others may may well dis disagree. So I, I think that uh, a bigger emphasis on on prompts within Comet may be helpful. In terms of, uh, did you mention iChom as well? Uh, no. Oh, Cosmin, Cosmin and Cosmin. Comet. Cosmin, yes. yes. The, the Cosmin initiative is certainly, um, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm, 
Uh, I, I, I'm somewhat conflicted uh, because of exactly the same reasons of petty interest in uh, own developments that I was mentioning. So, as you see, everything needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, the, um, for BiblioPro, we're using the Empro system, which is significantly overlaps, I mean, in terms of concepts uh, with uh, the Cosmin uh, approach. But it has also some differences uh, and um, the, the benefits of, of using Empro in terms of having an evalu formal evaluation of the uh, um, of the properties of of a of a uh, instrument rather on the quality of the evaluation itself that was done that is the, the main focus of of Cosmin makes it preferable for us for Empro. Of course, if at any point we realized that there was a better option, I would hope that we would uh, uh, be happy to adopt uh, another another uh, measurement. But by a large, I must say, I mean, they've clearly succeeded in um, raising attention about the need for uh, high standards. And uh, it's also serving the purpose of identifying um, difference. I mean, um, um, what may be the better instruments for a given purpose. Okay, thank you, Chema. Uh, well, we we think of it that we can just uh, we just have ten minutes more for for the questions and answers because we had some technical problems. There is another question for Dr. Stam uh, from Dr. De Gouveia Santos. Uh, he says, congratulations to the organizers for this excellent initiative and also to all the speakers. How can we integrate to the last project presented by Tania Stam? I hope I guess he means that this can be implemented in, in other settings, I guess, Tania. Yes, and I think that's a very important question. And I was about, uh, I wanted to answer a similar thing to the question before, because I think um, we have a lot of initiatives yeah, uh, at the European level and everywhere. And I think what is really key is that we find ways of how the providers, how the patients can be involved. Yeah? So we need to, I think, really uh, change the way how we think about outcome measurement and try to involve uh, all the people. And we are constantly thinking of how we can involve more uh, people into our project. And we also aim really at having uh, a population or at, at um, that the H2O uh, project or that the tools will be available to patients on a population level so that all diabetes patients, for example, in Austria could actually participate independent of the providers. So I think it would be really important and especially because we are not only connecting large hospitals, but we're also thinking of the GPs, of the general uh, practice. Yeah, and I think I think it will be really important to see how we can uh, connect to uh, all these um, different providers. And if people would be interested, I think it would be great if they can can send us an email. And because we would be, we, we always need experts. We are now speci especially looking into the feasibility of outcome sets and outcome measures. So we are uh, looking for participants for the Delphi studies that we will be conducting. And if people would be interested. I think it would be great if you would send us an email and, and um, we can get involved. And I think that that would be uh, really great. And I think it's important to really have an overview on the different initiatives also. And so that they also, like you have uh, said before, Chema, that they really work together and we will find um, I don't know, we will in the end agree on, on specific outcome sets maybe and, and uh, on specific standards or taxonomies which we then we will use in order to really compare the scores. Okay, uh, another question for Judy. Uh, do you think telemedicine with, which exploded during the COVID pandemic will facilitate the use of prompts? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's simple. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that you're, you're trying to, you're not able to touch the patient, so you have to hear them. Mm. So getting a validated history is really important, and that's what that's what the PROs are allowing us to do. Okay, thanks, Judy. A uh, question from Ana Belén Salamanca to Dr. Valderas. Uh, first of all, congratulations for the webinar. I have a question for Dr. Valderas. How are you going to advance with PREMS? Are you going to correlate PROMS and PREMS in any, mom in any moment? Um, what we know about outcomes and experience is that they are correlated, uh, but not uh, highly. 
typically is around uh, 0.3. Um, uh, so the, 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 there are some elements that they ca they capture. Um, I think that uh, uh, some of them uh, are the explanation for this. That some of them are related to the indeed to the quality of care aspects of quality of, of care and and outcomes. I mean that the, it's shared in itself, and also they may be also aspects of personality of uh, uh, respond uh, of uh, a way in which people in which people uh, respond to to questions. Um, I think that the, we may see the diff this association vary uh, depending on what models of care are implemented. So as, as we see progressively uh, more uh, attention being paid to collecting routinely experiences uh, and outcomes as part of routine care, it is not unlikely that we may uh, start to see uh, a better correlation uh, if uh, systems deliver on what they set to do that is be more responsive to patients' needs. And one would expect that it would be the case both for experience and, out or, and outcomes. Although it's probably easier to some degree to address the issues of, of experiences than uh, the outcomes. Perhaps a, a testable uh, <laughs> hypothesis and a, a research question. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is a question for Tanya. Uh, when the observatory is in place and working with standardization, interpretation of measures, etc., what do you think its functions will be? Yes, thank you for the question. I think on the one hand it will be the collection of the data and on the other hand it will also be the accessibility of the data sets because I think that will be also important that data will be available for researchers not only from the public sector but also uh, from the private sector so that all the stakeholders who have an interest also regulators and authorities uh, have access to the data and we will also have for example patient organization who might need the data so uh, collection of data empowering patients with the data but also being available yeah? so having data sets which are available i think that would be really important okay uh i think uh, there, there is another question i have uh, i think for tanya and chema uh, regarding massive assessments of proms and prems like you you're trying to to do in, in your in, in your projects. Um, I think we are already overcoming technical challenges for the assessment, but do you think there's still much work to do regarding uh, legal and ethical issues uh, for data reutilization and data sharing between different settings, different countries? Um, what do you what could you say about that? I mean, I think these are the most important things because technically I think that's easy to do, yeah, in fact. But what we need is we need to have the legal and ethical frameworks in place for sharing the data. We, and I think what is also essential is the patient perspective with regards to collecting the data. So not only having the questionnaires which cover what matters to the patient, but also to do something which is feasible for the patient because nobody will fill in lengthy questionnaires every other week. Yeah, so I think we also need to take into account uh, the patient perspective and the value we generate and that patients will uh, then fill in the, the instruments on the basis of what they can get back out of it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I may simply add that the um, uh, implications uh, will probably vary whether we're talking about uh, of uh, individual use of uh, data for clinical purposes or uh, for um, evaluation of health system performance and provider performance in which it, you typically uh, would uh, expect those data to be uh, anonymized uh, um, uh, very early in the process. Uh, but uh, it is true that we are facing increasing uh, um, uh, expectations uh, for the anonymization to go well beyond uh, just removing uh, identifiers and actually uh, the existing of sufficient other information that would make perhaps a particular combination of conditions or uh, 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 in a particular geographical area that make make the patient somewhat identifiable. I, I, I think that this may um, 
um, from a research perspective, uh, these are sometimes seen as as barriers uh, to the efficient use of the the information. I obviously completely un understand uh, the, the 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 rationale for them uh, being in in place, um, and I, I think that in in the end, I mean, we we will have to uh, 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 come up with a framework, as Tania is suggesting, that uh, um, uh, is a um, valid and 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 for uh, for addressing these issues uh, from a global perspective okay thank you very much to to all of you i think we, it's time for closure uh, closure uh, i don't know jordi if you if you want to make the the closure of the of the session of the webinar so uh, first of all, thank you for all of the presenters and uh, all who have made possible this webinar. Apologies for technical uh, problems. I think that the content, the interest, uh, novelty and the relevance of, of uh, uh, the experience of the presenters have overcome uh, these problems. And, uh, and I think that they also uh, have uh, answer part of the questions we had uh, for prompts and print in practice, but they have also raised a number of them for the future uh, standardization, implementation, uh, how this implementation come back to improvement to, of care and, and improvement of health systems. So, so uh, in, in, in I, I would say uh, that um, there's a need of not overlapping too much the work because it's too much work to be done and too many objectives to achieve, so, so coordination will be essential. Thank you very, very much to all of you for uh, for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, we are uh, really happy to uh, have you uh, and uh, we'll promise we'll come back with some new uh, uh, um, uh, webinars and, and proposals uh, to follow up these questions. Uh, Monse, I don't know if you want to say a few words. No, just to say thank you to the presenters, thank you to the moderator, Aida Rivera. Thank you very much for the effort during <laughs> this uh, difficult <laughs> uh, flow. And, and of course, thank you to the attendants that I, I, I hope, I expect you, you have enjoyed the, the webinar and see you soon. Thank you.